Now this week it's the turn of a man who, having left public school, was presented with a single ticket to America and invited to carve himself a future. In the fullness of time he did, and in so doing, became one of the most popular radio presenters in this country, certainly within his own chosen field of music. My guest this week then, Radio One's John Peel, and I asked him first where and when he was born. Well, I was born in the uh, village of Heswell, on the edge of the River Dee, and uh, moved after you know, after the appropriate time down to uh, a village called Burton, also on the edge of the River Dee, where I spent the first 17 years of my life. What did your father do for a living? Well, my father was uh, in the cotton industry, and uh, he'd surrendered the family firm over to uh, my grandfather, who then very quickly retired, so that he could go and serve in the army, because uh, the war started some three or four days after I was born, and my dad was already in the army when it did start. So the family business was kind of wound up, pretty much, during the war, and my father managed to revive it after the war long enough to keep him fed and clothed, and us fed and clothed. But uh, it wasn't a, a going concern, really, and after he died, the, in fact, when he retired, the family business shut up. Brothers and sisters? Well, I have two brothers. There's Francis, who was born two years after me as uh, the result of a liaison between my father and mother when my father came back from North Africa on leave. And uh, Francis insures nuns. He's been in the insurance business for one, in one way or another for most of his adult life, but now works for a company which specializes in insuring nuns and their premises, which always strikes me as the most odd thing to be doing. So he spends a great deal of his time drifting around from convent to convent and, uh, you know, taking supper with the mother superiors and stuff. Most odd, but uh, he seems to like it. And then there's Alan, who was born just after the war, some seven years younger than me, and he's a television director, uh, independent television director, and uh, his main achievements have been doing such, bringing to the screen such things as um, Pam Ayres in Australia was one of his greatest achievements, and uh, also J Jackie Charlton on fishing was something else for which he was responsible, a man who's contributed a great deal to the <laughs> cultural life of the nation. <laughs> well, well you, phrase it, you phrase it nicely anyway. Um, what about your schooling? Well, uh, I was packed off to a uh, local kindergarten um, at the age of four, if I remember. And, of course, in those days, you didn't have a couple of years of sort of act action painting and plasticine and stuff like that. You were stuck straight into actually learning things. And I remember being taught the days of the week in French in my first week in school. So it's fairly intensive stuff. And uh, I, m I failed to make much of an impression, uh, to be honest, during my first uh, term there, because uh, when the headmistress wrote her report at the end of the term saying in exactly those words that I'd failed to make much impression. She got my name wrong. I mean, she said, Robin has failed to make much of an impression. So uh, if I ever write my autobiography, it'll be called something like Robin has failed to make much impression. <laughs> um, but uh, I served there until I was seven. And then when I was seven, I was packed off to boarding school in North Wales, um, where I served with remarkable lack of distinction. Actually failed my common entrance, but because uh, both my grandfathers and my father and several other relatives in the dim distance and past had gone to Shrewsbury. They kind of nodded me through, so I went on to Shrewsbury. And uh, I was bottom of the school my first term, which I was extraordinarily proud. I thought it gave me a great distinction, but uh, my, my father didn't take the same enlightened view at all. Uh, he was rather cross. But uh, they used to have this big, uh, at, at the speech day celebrations each year, the entire school would walk past in, in order of precedence, and uh, you had to salute the headmaster as you went past. And I was the last person to go past, and I thought this was made me just as distinguished as the first person to go past. And I still believe that to be true, actually. Um, but th at, at Shrewsbury, uh, I did uh, very, well, fairly poorly. I wish I'd done better, to be honest. I'm not particularly proud of this. But nobody had ever explained to me why it was that it would be be a good idea for me to work a little harder than I was doing and uh, I had a horror of university because I had an idea of university that was rooted fairly firmly in sort of Victorian in the Victorian area and I assumed that if I did go to university it'd be pretty much an extension of going to public school except sort of worse and bigger you know and that on my first day there I should have to stand on a kind of 400 year old refectory table and sing there is a tavern in the town in Latin and be pelted with bread rolls so when people said to me if you don't work uh, you won't be able to go to university I thought ah you've given me the secret to eternal happiness I now rather regret that I must admit so I, I left Shrewsbury with four O levels, um, which weren't much, I and mean, that was in the days when you either passed or failed, you didn't get sort of grades. And uh, so I had four O levels, and really no idea at all what I was going to do, but uh, no chance of going to university, alas. 
If you say that you had no early aspirations, um, how did you then move into the working world? Well, I was, I was quite happy. I mean, I wanted to be on the radio, you see. I mean, I, from a very early age indeed, from 11 or 12, I used to listen to Radio Luxembourg and to the American forces in Europe broadcasting from Stuttgart, I think. And I used to think I'd really like to do that because I naively assumed that the DJs that I was listening to chose the records that they played in their programs. And I thought, as a collector of records, even at that early age, and living out in the country really with nobody at all to play them to, and being at schools where taking an interest in popular music was regarded as terribly kind of a working class thing to do, you know, not the sort of thing which uh, most people did. A bit of jazz, certainly amongst the more eccentric people in the school, but, you know, rock and roll. Uh, was regarded as being incredibly in for a dig. So when I left school, uh, I realised I was going to have to do national service. Uh, I'd applied for early call-up because I knew I was going to have to go in anyway. And uh, it was quite a wise move, in fact, because I went in when I was 17, and other, I mean, my contemporaries, by and large, went in when they were 19. So I was coming out as they were going in, so I got it over early. Thoroughly enjoyed it, actually. Um, uh, the, the basic training was fairly horrendous, but it was for everybody, uh, particularly so for me, though, because uh, as a public schoolboy, I was expected to get a commission. And uh, being a rather shy and retiring youth, uh, I performed very, very badly in all of the tests that they gave me and failed to get a commission. And was probably the first public school boy to fail to get a commission in Her Majesty's Forces. So a lot of NCOs have been waiting for most of their l military lives for somebody like me to come along. So they made my life fairly difficult at times. But, um, uh, you know, I quickly, I, I quickly sort of worked my way into a position where I could look after myself and uh, isolate myself from the more hostile uh, people. Because I was, I was posted to a place called Trials Establishment Guided Weapons Royal Artillery, which was uh, at Tecroy's camp in Anglesey, which was very near to where my grandfather had lived most of his life, in fact, a couple of miles away, and where I'd spent all of my summer holidays. So I knew a lot of people there in a lot of places and managed to uh, develop for myself a really rather nice little setup. I had a motorbike got a job as the battery runner and just used to ride around on my motorbike all over the camp, uh, sitting in people's radar sets, drinking tea or playing football. It was a really most happy existence. And it coincided with one of those long, sort of cloudless summers, uh, the summer of 59, I think it would have been. And uh, it was like being, at a, it was like being at, a, at a holiday camp. It really was. It was absolutely wonderful. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, of course, there was no danger at all of anybody either shooting at you or, or you having to shoot at anybody else. So I, I spent a certain amount of time painting radar sets and things. And, uh, but I found that I quite liked sort of manual labour, you know. So when I'd, when I'd finished my national service, my father was anxious to discover what I was going to do next, you know, what kind of a career I had lined up for myself. I was very vague about it indeed, and he said to me, I'll send you to America if you'll go. And it was one of those kind of bravado things. He said, yeah, okay, Dad, you know, send me, see if I care. And uh, then found to my horror that he'd got me booked aboard the SS Eugene Likes bound for Houston. <laughs> Prior to that, though, uh, while we were waiting to do that, uh, he sent me off to work for a mate of his who had a cotton mill in Rochdale, the town head mill, where I just did kind of very physical work indeed and got quite fit and strong as a consequence of doing it in a room that was so noisy that it wasn't necessary to sort of keep up uh, conversations conversations throughout the day. He couldn't even if he wanted to. And I really enjoyed that. I would have been quite happy, I mean, genuinely, I think, quite happy going on doing that for most of my life. I, you know, I, was, I felt fit and, and I, was, I felt sort of self-contained and uh, very content, you know. And I lived in Borden Lodgings in Rochdale and at the day, end of the day's work, walked back through town and did a bit of shopping and, you know, bought the newspapers and went up to my little room and sat in there and listened to the radio and read the papers. I was very happy doing it. But anyway, the time came for me to go to Houston and I set off from Liverpool on about a three-week crossing because it was just a freighter, you know. And that was beautiful as well, very calm crossing, extraordinary sunsets you get in mid-Atlantic that take, really take your breath away. I mean, you just spent a lot of time just lying on the deck staring into the sky in a rather hippified sort of fashion. This was pre-hippie, of course. Um, I went to Houston. On my first day in Houston, saw a news vendor stabbed to death on Main Street and assumed that this was uh, an exceptional occurrence, but of course it actually wasn't at all. And uh, but I was a bit alarmed by this. I caught the train the next day up to Dallas, um, where I had a couple of uh, addresses that my father had given me, uh, little realising that I was actually getting into kind of the lunacy capital of America, you know, where the maddest bloke got to be mayor. And I spent about four years in Dallas. You must then have been there during the time that Kennedy was assassinated. 
Well, it's one of my best stories, actually, and one of those things which nobody ever really believes. You can always, whenever I start to tell people this, you can see them kind of nudging each other and thinking, oh, poor old fellow's off again, you know. So what happened was... Um, they had, in the election campaigns in 1960, uh, Nixon and Kennedy had parades through Dallas on consecutive days. And I ran out, uh, because obviously there were a lot of people jostling around and the security was fairly lax, because at that time, obviously, no presidents had been assassinated for quite some time. So uh, there was a lot of people sh rushing forward and shaking hands with the candidates. So I shook hands with... Um, Nixon and who was his running mate? I never can remember. Was it, was it Barry Goldwater? Yeah, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, anyway, I shook hands with both of them. And then the following day went out and uh, did the same with Kennedy. The difference being that uh, Kennedy actually stopped and spoke to me because I said something like, good luck, Mr. Kennedy. And he said, hey, you're from England, aren't you? And I said, yes. And we had a bit of a conversation. And of course, at the time, it didn't seem that important to me, you know, so I can't remember very much about it. And I always say to people, if I was making this up, I should have it a great, much more detailed story than, in fact, I've got. But I stood and talked to him. It might have been for sort of half a minute. It might have been for a couple of minutes. I really can't remember. And uh, what impressed me, though, was the fact that he talked about me. He asked me what I was going to be doing, whether I liked it, you know, where I was going to stay and so forth. And uh, then when he got a bit bored with me, he said, you know, why don't you go around to the other side of the car and shake hands with uh, LBJ? So I did that and then went back into the crowd. Well, uh, so I was still in Dallas. Uh, when he was assassinated and it was announced over the PA at the insurance company where I was working uh, Republic National Life Insurance Company 3988 North Central Expressway if you ever need a policy there are the people to get in touch with um, and uh, it was announced over this, the speaker system you know, in house and people cheered um, and the same thing happened. I was going out with a, a girl at Brian Adams High School in Dallas at the same time, and it was, when it was announced there, people cheered as well. I mean, people were genuinely pleased that he'd been shot. He was not a popular man in Dallas, uh, or in Texas generally, because his policies threatened the kind of oil subsidies on which the entire state's economy floated. Um, so I rushed in, out of the building and leapt into my car and drove down into central Dallas and parked the car, went down to where the police cordon had been thrown up around the, the, the assassination area and told them I was working for the Liverpool Echo. And uh, when they heard a, a Liverpool, you know, an English accent, they assumed that I was telling the truth and just waved me through. I remember the policeman whose you know, job it was to stop me was in floods of tears at the time. And so I went down and wandered about all over the, the assassination site. And uh, at that time, I mean, this was, must have been a good hour after it had happened. They were still concentrating their energies on the famous grassy knoll and the railway marshalling yards beyond and weren't paying much attention to the Texas book depository. So anyway, I potted about for a bit and then went and I thought, well, I might as well sort of make what I have been saying to people roughly true and phone the Liverpool Echo. And they, of course, with uh, the provincial journalist's uh, eye for a story, did a kind of paragraph on the front page, but very much a kind of Heswell man in Dallas, you know, it's one of those things, uh, sort of uh, plane crash kills 250, no Bury St Edmunds man amongst dead, you know, that kind of uh, view of things. Um, so uh, uh, I did that, and then I said to them, you know, if, if I come up with anything else, do you want me to phone you back? And they said, well, yeah, I suppose so. They obviously weren't terribly interested. So a mate of mine called Bob Cook and I went down to the jail that evening and uh, just hung around and, until we heard somebody say that there was going to be a press conference. And we just walked into the press conference. Now, this whole thing sounds so unlikely that I got to the point where I didn't really believe it myself until uh, I saw a video of one of those... Um, the programme, I think, that Granada TV did, uh, like Who Killed Kennedy? And they did a couple of shots panning across the, um, the, the, the room where they ha held the press conference, which was in the basement of the jail, a place where they used to do the kind of line-ups, you know, which one of these men snatched your bag kind of stuff. And uh, not only, which I didn't know until I saw the film, not only was Jack Ruby in the room, but as they pan across the room in the very last few frames, there am I. And it's really a most unnerving thing to see because I'd never seen this bit of film before. And suddenly think to see yourself, you know, in a situation that you've been describing to people for a long time, but it actually got to the point where you thought you were making it up yourself because it sounded so unlikely. So there I was in, the, in this press conference. Uh, with Bob standing at the edge chatting and uh, the district attorney, Henry Wade, got up in the corner and said, you know, we're now going to produce the man who uh, has been charged with the assassination of President Kennedy and they brought in Lee Harvey Oswald and he stood there for a bit and you've probably seen the film of him being questioned things with a gang of policemen standing behind him. Well, I was standing sort of next to the camera that shot that film, you know, so I was like about five, six feet away from him and 
I've, I've always said, and I've, that either he was a very good actor or he had no idea what was going on. I mean, I've no, he just he's just sat there, and the expression on his face, and he said, like, you know, he just looked like a country boy who'd been picked up for something that he hadn't done, and he just looked utterly bemused by the whole business. So, I mean, I was very sceptical, as most people in Dallas were, about almost everything that you ever heard about the Kennedy assassination from that point on. And the more they did, you know, the Warren Commission reports and so on, uh, the more ludicrous the official version of things became. Especially, I mean, things like the ballistic evidence, you know, were just quite plainly mad. And everybody knew, everybody in Dallas, because everybody had guns, everybody knew that what he was supposed to have done just simply wasn't possible, he couldn't possibly be done. So everyone was very sceptical about it, but they accepted the official version of things because it was in their interest to do so. But a most interesting period. And of course, it's one of those things, whenever they do a program about the assassination now, uh, you know, I watch it with a great deal of interest. Well, loath as I am to move away from that subject, and I truly am loath, um, how into this business? It, go it goes back, I suppose, really, um, to when I was in the army, and I was, as I say, stationed in Anglesey, and very interested in the rowdier forms of music even then. So my heroes were people like Gene Vincent and uh, Little Richard. And in fact, yeah, well, we organized a trip from the camp to go and see Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent uh, about three or four days before he, Eddie Cochran was killed in the car crash. Um, so anyway, I was very interested in records, as I say. And there was one other lad in the billet with me who was quite keen on the sort of things that I liked as well. And uh, so we used to have kind of record sessions in the billet, and I'd play all these things to people. Most of them they didn't like. But then I, I started getting into kind of blues things as well. Uh, Sam Lightning Hopkins was a particular favourite, and uh, a lot of... Um, sort of wartime blues things too, from the period when people were moving from being like a single acoustic guitar player to being little electric bands. So I took all of these records with me to America, and there was a station in Dallas, WRR, uh, that had a program from 10 till midnight on weeknights called Cat's Caravan, spelt inevitably with two Ks. And um, they played mainly rhythm and blues with the occasional kind of comedy record thrown in as well because the comedy it was in the period when comedy records by people like uh, Shelley Berman and Mort Saal and so on, Jonathan Winters, were like the best-selling LPs in the country. It was a very strange period. So uh, I went down to WRR with these records and said, you know, would, be in, would you be interested in playing any of these? And uh, they said yes, and would you like to come and talk about them? Now, I assumed that the reason they'd asked me to do it is because of my comprehensive knowledge of music and the blues in particular and so on. I think, actually, in retrospect, the reason they'd asked me is because I used to have the most extraordinary speaking voice. I mean, like a minor member of the royal family. And I've got the original recordings of, of, uh, of this program, which I'm not about to let you hear. Um, which I, I've got very high-pitched sort of voice and I'm um, talking about the blues and saying things like well of course these chappies you know they, they couldn't drag their pianos into the cotton fields to play their boogie woogie and stuff like that. I mean it's just quite mad um, and uh, they, they obviously put me on the radio thinking people are gonna not believe this you know um, so I did that for a while, and uh, every Monday night I did an hour on there, and then after about sort of seven or eight weeks, I asked them if they'd start paying me, and at that point they told me to clear off. Um, but by that time, I, you know, I'd been bitten by the bug, because, I mean, this is what I'd always wanted to do. And so I used to just hang around radio stations generally and make a nuisance of myself, so that when the Beatles came along and uh, a chap called Russ Knight, the Weird Beard, on radio station KLIF in Dallas... Um, when he was talking about Liverpool one night, I was able to phone him up on the news line and say, actually, you've got all of that wrong, you know, and he said, are you from Liverpool? And I said, well, near enough, you know. So they put me on the air, and uh, I started talking about Liverpool and setting them straight and so on. Of course, now, Americans are charming people in many ways, but of course, very, ex I mean, even quite educated Americans, if they're not travelled much, have an extraordinary view of what Europe's like. I mean, I'd meet people and they'd say, hey, fellow, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from England. They'd say, England, is that in France? You know, and stuff like that. And, and uh, they'd always, the older ones had always been over here during the war. You know, they say, hey, listen, I was, uh, I was in your uh, Leicestershire during the war. I met this guy, Bob. Do you know Bob from Leicestershire? And he'd say, N no, I don't think I do. And they'd be quite hurt, you know. They'd assume that you were lying to them. So I capitalised, rather, on this naivety because they assumed that if I came from anywhere near Liverpool, uh, if I wasn't a blood relative of uh, several of the Beatles, at least I would know them intimately. And I never said that I did know them, but then again, I never said that I didn't. <laughs> so I got, I got uh, taken on as a sort of part-time Beatle expert by KLIF and uh, used to get mobbed in downtown Dallas as a kind of surrogate Beatle. It was enormously exciting. Um, and then eventually was offered a full-time job on the strength of being English by a radio station in Oklahoma City called KOMA. 
and I went to work for them for about 18 months, then got fired because the ratings weren't terribly good, and applied for a job, or jobs in California, in San Diego and San Bernardino, just because I'd never been to California. And I was offered jobs by both of them without a, an audition table. It happens, I knows what the, I mean, it's the most extraordinary setup. I mean, I just wrote and said that I was English and that I was looking for a job, and they both offered me work. And I, I chose San Bernardino because I thought it was a more attractive name than San Diego. I mean, that sounds ludicrous, but it's true. And uh, so I went out to San Bernardino and worked there for about 18 months. And then, uh, for one reason or another, I decided it was time to come back home. And came back home in the beginning of 67 and uh, turned up in London at my mother's house, um, out of work, obviously. But fortunately, next door to us was a chap who did a lot of advertising through Radio London, and he said, why don't you go down to Radio London and see my pal Alan Keane? And I went down there, and again, w without any audition at all, but just purely on the strength of being able to say that I'd been working on the radio in California, so they thought, oh, he must be hot stuff. They put me on uh, Radio London, and uh, so I just did an ordinary Top 40 programme but then, because I was kind of like the last man on board, I used to have to do the graveyard shift, which was very people didn't want to do at all because they were all busy either sleeping or getting drunk or watching blue films upstairs with the crew. And uh, so I volunteered to do from midnight till two. And then realising that nobody on board was listening, I started dispensing with the format, didn't do the news, didn't run any of the ads, didn't do the weather forecast, and just started playing some of the records that I'd brought back from California, you know, which was sort of, this was like the hippie era. And uh, the programme, I even, I even gave it a name, I called it The Perfumed Garden, and it became, like, stupendously popular, so that by the time Radio London went off the air uh, in the summer of 67, as a result of the Marine Offences Act, um, I was getting sort of like ten times as much mail as the rest of the people in this radio station put together, not because of my uh, great charm and personality or my rugged good looks, but just because people liked the music. And uh, you know, I've always believed rather naively that radio programmes should essentially be about the music anyway, and uh, this rather confirmed me in this, in this view. So. I mean, I still go, you know, if I go to Holland and places like this, I still occasionally bump into, hello, uh, we remember Perfume Garden, uh, we like this one very much. And uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, as I say, it confirmed me in my belief that uh, radio programmes, you know, music programmes should be about music and not about personalities. Because it's only in Britain, I think, uh, that DJs are kind of... We have a strange culture here, as you're obviously aware, and it's it's... it's um, my friends, our friends from Europe find it most entertaining that we have a kind of culture where news readers and weather forecasters and DJs are seen as celebrities because I mean it's just quite mad that it should be so if you think about it um, so I've never really been able to come you know sort of really believe in the idea that DJs were somehow rather special and wonderful human beings uh, so the programs that I've done ever since have always just been about the music and I seem to see my function as being essentially an editorial one I constantly get into trouble for calling myself a presser of knobs and a puller of levers. Well, I'm not a technical man myself, and it's one of the problems that uh, I have is that people assume that if you've got a job like ours, that you can kind of fix their stereo. You know what I mean? You go, you go to people's houses, and they take it's like being a doctor. They take you to one side and say, having a spot of bother with the left-hand channel. I wonder if you can have a look at it. So look, there's, there's anything more technically complicated than a toothbrush, and I'm at them at depth. And they never believe you. They just think you're being difficult. But, I mean, I'd, you know, as long as I've got uh, two turntables, and I've, I've, it's uh, with a great deal of reluctance that I've come to terms with compact disc technology, I refuse to have anything to do with DAT cassettes and stuff like that, because I just, I mean, I don't understand. It. They've got the machinery for it at Radio 1, and it means nothing to me, and I'm determined that it shall never mean anything to me. And uh, Also, I think there's, uh, I've, I like to play sometimes, if I'm playing an old record, which I don't often do, but to play the, the original 45, scratchy though it may be, because I always feel that it has a kind of spiritual quality that is lost when it's transferred to kind of flawless sound on compact disc. I feel it doesn't sound the same, doesn't sound right somehow. You know, it's when they take, as people do, when they take sort of old acoustic recordings from the 20s and kind of tart them up and make them sound as though they were recorded yesterday and I think well it, you know the sound is now clearer but a lot of what made it attractive in the first place has been eliminated. Can I ask you um, we have actually had a, a phone in at Radio Cambridge uh, uh, in respect of the computerized choice of music give us your view. 
Well, I wouldn't have anything to do with it myself. Um, I worked uh, at the station at KOMA in Oklahoma City. It had just come off being a computerised station uh, when I first went to work for them, and it had been an unqualified disaster. And I just think, uh, I mean, I know that some of the, I think Capital Radio and some of the other commercial stations are uh, work from a similar kind of system, but to me, it's, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with it. I don't like the idea at all. Let's get personal if we can. How did you meet your lady wife? Well, it's fairly simple, but simple in a complicated way, in that I'd been married before. I'd got married in uh, Tex well, in Oklahoma, in fact, but to a Texan uh, woman of, well, it's a girl. She was only 15 years old when we got married, and it was a fairly catastrophic marriage. didn't work out at all. Um, and uh, we'd separated uh, long before I actually met Sheila, and she was in the studio audience when I did... Uh, I used to do a regular television programme called How It Is with Richard Neville, who was the editor of Oz magazine. And uh, it was usually done at Lime Grove, but for a couple of editions when they were refurbishing the studios at Lime Grove, they moved to what are now the Riverside Studios on the edge of the Thames in Hammersmith. And they used to recruit uh, audiences from local colleges and so on. So for those two, they went out to Roehampton, where Sheila was at a teacher's training college. And uh, her two friends, Terry and Jerry, wanted to come along because they quite liked me. You know, they liked the programs that I did and so on. She thought I was a complete twerp, but came along because they used to pay you ten bob a time to be in the studio audience, and she needed it, uh, you know, as beer money. So um, Richard and I always used to, in a rather sexist way, I regret to say, before the programme started, we used to go out and sort of wander around on the stage and pretend that we were doing something very deep and meaningful, but actually sort of checking out people in the audience. And I remember seeing her up at the back, and she was wearing a dark green jumper, and it's the only time in my life I've ever done it. And I thought to myself, I cannot let her get away. I just, she just looked so wonderful, and I thought, I simply have got to do something to make contact with her. And I couldn't really do an awful kind of clambering up through the audience, do you come here often, do you like the band routine? Um, so I asked one of the other people on the program, a fellow called Ronnie Fletcher, who does the sort of uh, quotes on quote-unquote and things like that. He does a wonderful speaking voice. I said to him, Ronnie, I said, I've got to rush off after I've done my little bit. But I said, you see the girl up there in the green jumper? I said, can you give her this note? I always told her afterwards that I sent out 40 such notes on the night in question, and she was the only person who replied, which isn't true. Uh, she knows. And I just asked her to call me. Well, she was going to throw the note away. I said, I don't want to speak to that. She had a very Yorkshire accent, you know. That, uh, and she, so she said, I, you know, she didn't want to have anything to do with me anyway. But her two mates said, uh, oh, no, no, you must phone him, you must phone him. So... Uh, they kind of dragooned her into going to the phone box, and uh, she phoned up, and I said, you know, do you want to go out? And so it was like, the voice is obviously, you wants me to go out with him, that kind of stuff. And he said, I don't want to go out with him. And they were saying, yes, you must, you must, you must. So anyway, eventually she was, she, she was persuaded to come out with me, and uh, it kind of went from there. How long did you court her? Well, um, I suppose she was living at the time in, in St. Stephen's Gardens in uh, London, in Bayswater, um, and uh, I, I was living in Upper Harley Street uh, by Regent's Park, rather ritzy area indeed. And I suppose we were sort of going out. I mean, I, I had at that time, so it was quite fashionable to be me because it was during the hippie era. So there were um, the house was always full of kind of actresses that didn't act and models that didn't model and so on. And uh, you know, who, who, who would turn up and sort of tell me how wonderful I was for the price of a meal, you know. Um, so uh, she she was very different to all of these people because she's just very direct and, as I say, very Yorkshire. And if I said anything stupid, the rest of them would just say, you know, oh, how wonderful, you're so cool, you're so groovy, you're so clever. And if I said anything stupid to her, she'd just say, hey, you're a daft bugger like this. And, and uh, So and, and eventually, I used to think this was terribly disrespectful, but gradually it dawned on me that she was, in fact, correct, you know, and that the rest of them were wrong. So... Uh, we started, you know, going out or uh, staying in, I suppose, um, after about 18 months, I suppose. And then uh, eventually I moved in with her and Terry and Jerry over in Bayswater in an area which was always uh, the focus of studies on substandard housing. It's a very dodgy area. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Reflections here on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. Now my guest again this week is the radio presenter John Peel. John, last week we closed the show just as you moved in with the lady who was in the fullness of time to be your wife. What next? 
But we, we decided to try and save up money to get a place of our own. And she was, you know, still at teachers' training college. And then she started teaching at a school in Kentish Town at Ackland Burley. And uh, there was a class, a legendary class there called Two Gil Hooley, because her maiden name is Gil Hooley. And uh, one of the members of Madness, in fact, the sax player was Madness, was one of the people in Two Gil Hooley. Um, and then after a while, uh, we, but we got fed up with London, to be honest. I mean, I've, I've, I've never particularly liked London. I, I hate having to go there now. If I didn't have to work there, I'd never go there. I find nothing attractive about it. And uh, she was getting fed up as well. And my dad was very ill at the time. I mean, he, he died of cancer. And um, we used to go up and see him in North Wales. And he had spent his whole life working, and you know, and quite hard, but living comfortably because, you know, he had a reasonable amount of money because my, my grandmother was quite a wealthy woman, but all the money subsequently disappeared, I should emphasise. But, um, uh, and he had moved out to the country uh, upon retirement, and then about two years after... Uh, he'd been he'd, he'd moved out there. He found out he had cancer and died. And he said to us, you know, before he died, he said, uh, "If you're going to go and live in the country, he said, go, don't do what I've done." He said, "Go and do it now." He said, "It'll be inconvenient initially, but you'll never regret it." And uh, so we did. And uh, we looked for about two and a half years. We started looking to the west of London, but the house prices were uh, too great. And, and we drifted in an arc over uh, the north of London and settled in East Anglia, which was an area that neither of us had ever really visited before at all. I'd been through on the train to, to, Norf to Norwich once. This is true. It's the only time I'd ever been in East Anglia. And... Uh, we looked around in this area for about 18 months, and uh, I used to have hair down to me bum in those days, and uh, we used to spend long weekends sleeping in a, a Land Rover, you know, in, in, in on the edge of fields and so on, going around looking at houses. And of course, most of them, uh, you didn't need to slow down to see that there was something wrong. They're either in the flight path of an American air base, or they were next to a sewage farm or something. Um, but then when, when, when we came down here, uh, as soon as I saw the house, uh, I said, right, that's the one we've been looking for. And uh, Sheila took a bit of persuading, but I don't think she regrets having come to live here. And we've been here ever since. When did you marry? Uh, well, we married in 1974. And, uh, I had to check this with Sheila. <laughs> I'm really bad on dates, but I, I, I know that William is legitimate by a good year, so uh, I can work it out from his age. And we got married on the day after my birthday so that I'd not forget <laughs> when our anniversary was. Um, and we had a rather splendid wedding. I mean, for a long time, we didn't really plan to get uh, married at all. We just lived together perfectly happily. But then, for no particular reason, we suddenly decided it'd be nice to get married. And we thought, well, we can either have a sort of very quiet registry office marriage, or we can go mad and spend all of our savings on it. So we went mad and spent all of our savings on it. And we had a huge deal. I managed to con somebody into letting us use the grounds of Bedford College in London for nothing, which was a beautiful building and had sort of rolling parklands down to the edge of the lagoon in the park. And... Um, it was a really good mix of people. We had, we had a couple of coaches of people from the village, including all of the members of the youth club, which she Sheila and I had set up. And uh, we had my family and, and all of Sheila's family came pouring out of the north, great gangs of Yorkshire Catholics, and all, all of about five foot tall, <laughs> and uh, swarming all over the place. And then my family, my mother dressed for some extraordinary reason in what appeared to be deck chair material. And uh, but we had one or two kind of showbiz people, not very many. Uh, Terry Wogan came, because he was quite a good mate at the time. And uh, uh, the Rod Stewart and the Faces came, but there were about you know there were one or two other people in bands that we particularly liked. But it was a strange mixture of people. In fact, in all of the film we've got, I've got this rather eccentric aunt who lives in North Wales, wonderful woman, but very very odd. I mean, a real sort of P.G. Woodhouse character. And in all of the films that we've got, she's deep in conversation with Rod Stewart. And I've always wondered what on earth can they possibly have been talking about. I've never found out. <laughs> But uh, it was certainly a good deal. I mean, people in the village still talk about it, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was a good start. Talk to us for a few minutes, if you will, about the children. Well, again, initially we weren't planning to have any children. And, uh, as I say, once, once we started living here, and uh, you know, when, when we went to bed, Sheila would read to me the Just Williams stories. Because, when, believe it or not, when I'd been at school, these had been banned literature. They'd been seen as rather subversive, you know, to sort of rather polite boys' boarding school. Such a rowdy child would have been very much discouraged. So we weren't allowed to read them. 
And uh, they are wonderful. I mean, I love the jokes because they're not written in a patronising kind of way at all. They're kind of oogly boogly kind of school of uh, writing for children. None of that at all. It's very realistic and very funny, well written stories. So we sort of decided over a period of time, because we'd lie in bed shrieking with laughter at the adventures of William, and uh, we decided it'd be nice to have a William of our own. That sounds hopelessly cute now. But, um, so we, we sort of tested the mechanisms to see whether they worked, and it took first time. So then William came along, and... Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't see him being born because he had to be taken out with a pair of pliers. But uh, um, you know, obviously, we you know we were rather pleased with this and uh, decided to see if it worked again. And it uh, well, it did. So for uh, over a period of eight years, you know, of every couple of years, a child appeared. And uh, Sheila got progressively more ill with the with the arrival of each one to the point where, when Florence was born, who's the the youngest, she's coming up to eight. Um, she was. We were both seriously concerned for her life. Actually, I mean, she was really very ill indeed. So we stopped at that point. Otherwise, I think we'd have soldiered on, you know, until uh, it all stopped working. What do the little ones think about this dad? I suppose I hope anyway that they regret the fact that I have to spend so much time away from home, which is the last thing that I wanted to do. Really, was to be an absentee dad, having suffered through no fault of his own from having an absentee dad myself. Um, and the problem is now that working four nights a week on Radio 1, uh, they get home at about sort of five to four, and I leave at about ten past, quarter past four, you know, so I, I, I get up and have breakfast with them, but of course breakfast is such a chaotic feast anyway, and a lot of shouting and arguing and forgetting things and thinking, oh my goodness, I haven't got this and haven't done my homework and so on, and I'm just sitting rather grumpily at the end of the table trying to stay awake, so it's not a great communion between father and children. Uh, so the only time that I really see them is at the weekends, but then understandably and quite rightly so, and I'm very pleased that they do, at the weekends they go off and stay with their uh, appalling friends, you know, so that's, uh, I mean, I hope that's something which I didn't do. And it's very difficult when I'm talking particularly to William, who's the, the oldest, who's just about to be 14, um, and he says, well, you know, what happened when you went to stay with your friends, Dan? And I said, well, I never did. And he said, well, didn't they come to you? And I said, well... No, you know, people didn't do that. I mean, I didn't know anybody well enough to invite them, so come and spend the weekend with us, or, you know, do, do you want to come over and watch TV tonight or whatever? Um, and it, 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 he'd say, well, you know, when you are a bit older, what, what bands did you go and see? And I said, well, there weren't any bands, really. So what clubs did you go? And I said, well, there weren't any clubs. And you try and explain, and so there weren't the range of options. You know, there wasn't the range of options that they have now. And uh, when you talk about clothes and things... Um, you know, he says, well, what did you wear? And I said, well, you wore black shoes and, and uh, dark blue socks and grey trousers and uh, your white shirt and a dark jacket. And I said, if you'd wanted something as frivolous as a red shirt, you'd have to fly to Italy to get one, you know. I mean, these things just weren't available. And, of course, it's very difficult. It does sound as though you're talking about a different era on a different planet, really. Whether you accept the fact that you are a celebrity or not, uh, it has to be said that you are, and it has to be said that you're extremely well known. Uh, how do your immediate neighbours react to you? How do you get on with the, the local people, if indeed you have much contact with them? Oh, good Lord. Well, I mean, all of, all of our contacts are rooted in the village here. I mean, because as I say, I, I think, see, people only feel like that about you if you feel like that about yourself. I mean, I've noticed this with my colleagues at Radio 1 sometimes, no names, but, I mean, you know, they'd complain that they couldn't walk around in the streets without being recognised. But, of course, they'd go around in the streets in a tartan suit, talking the pitch of their lungs, surrounded by equally noisy people. And if you don't want to attract that sort of attention, then you don't, in my experience. I mean, I potter about all over London and uh, entirely unmolested and... Uh, you know, it, uh, so I think these things only happen if you want them to happen, really. Um, so in the village, which is good because Sheila's very much involved in village life, and the children are as well, and I am as you know as, as much as I can be. And uh, I th I, it is genuinely the case, and I don't. This sounds again terribly affected, but it is true that most people just know me as like either William's dad or Alexandra's dad or Thomas's dad or Florence's dad or a Sheila's husband. I mean, people, you know. Uh, but fortunately, people in, in in this area, one of the reasons we like it is uh, they're not terrifically impressed by the idea of uh, having a neighbour who works on the radio because it's not a terrifically impressive idea, you know. It's not, it always, so, I mean, they, uh, you know, they take me as they find me, really. Do you have time? Is there any sense, really, in asking you about uh, interests outside your immediate work? Well, uh, uh, I mean, my other main interest is... is, is always been football really and uh, uh, I used to play football very badly with great enthusiasm um, and 
Obviously, as I got older, I had to give that up. I wish I could still play. It's the one thing I, that I really miss, actually. Uh, and I used to go and watch Liverpool fairly regularly, but uh, I got a kicking at Villa Park a few years ago, which rather discouraged me from going to away matches. Um, and also going up to Anfield on one of, one of my few days off. You know, it, it takes up the entire day. I have to leave at about 7 o'clock in the morning. Don't get back till 11. So I'd, uh, these days, I'd sooner stay at home. Also, uh, Shula and myself were in the Hazel Stadium um, overlooking uh, the corner where all of the people died. We were in the grandstand overlooking where all of the people died. And that kind of rattled us considerably, as you might imagine. And in fact, neither of us had been to uh, a league match or to a football match at all since the Hazel Stadium until last year's cup final, actually. And we took our Tom to it because he's very keen on football and rather good at it, too. And uh, we were both really frightened. I mean, genuinely frightened in a sort of, you know, right down to the very sort of core of your being in a way that uh, uh, I never imagined it was possible to be frightened. But we thought we've got to do this. And we'd, we'd taken the children previously to, to see like, Madonna at Wembley. We'd been frightened by that as well, just by the crowds and so on. But uh, I was glad we went because it you know, helped us to put these things in perspective a bit more. And uh, I now I, I still haven't been to see Liverpool again since then. But uh, I now go and see Stowmarket whenever I can. Anyway, saw them get a good whack, good whacking at Sudbury Town a few weeks ago. Take us through, if you will, then a day in the life of. Well, they're very long days, and. Um, I always get rather cross when people assume, as people often do, that you work for like uh, an hour and a half a day and then the rest of the time, you know, it's, you're in the sauna with Swedish au pairs and stuff like that. Um, of course, it's a million miles from that. As I say, I get up uh, when I'm not too exhausted. I get up at about 7, 7.15 to have breakfast with the children and, uh, you know, to run them up to the bus, to catch the bus in the village. Um, and then I go into... Uh, my room and, and, and start working, you know, because the, the number of records and, that come, comes in and, the, and, and also tapes and, and letters, it, it's, I mean, you're never caught up. There's no possibility of ever being caught up, which is, again, rather frustrating. And um, with, with the letters and tapes, I do everything I can to answer them all. Of course, I have no, people assume again that you've got a team of secretaries and assistants and researchers and so forth. This, again, is entirely untrue. I mean, I, you know, I type me on envelopes, right? I have to do everything myself, which is fair enough. And it just means that it's impossible for me to do it all. So about once a year, I have, just have to sort of say, well, draw, we'll draw the line here and I'll start again trying to keep up and just throw everything away because uh, it becomes impossible to move around the house. So I, I go in and start listening to records and answering letters and uh, preparing that night's program. And then usually at about 12 o'clock, the secretary will phone up uh, and, and ask, you know, if I've finished putting the program together. And if I have, I then dictate it to her. I mean, just the times, the durations of the records, and the artist and the title. And then I have to fill in the other details myself when I get into town. And then I carry on. Um, you know, sorting out records, because I do other programs as well for places overseas. And uh, I record some in this room here um, for Bremen in North Germany and for uh, a program called Nacht Express in Austria and uh, Rock Radio in Finland and other bits and pieces. And um, so then the afternoon is spent in listening to records, perhaps recording a program. Uh, at, then, as I said earlier, at four o'clock the children come home, and at ten past four, quarter past four, I set off for town, um, either by train uh, if, or, or, or driving, depending on what I've got to do. Obviously, if you've got like three or four boxes of LPs, trying to take them on the train and then through the on the central line in London is horrendous, so I have to drive. But, of course, it becomes increasingly difficult driving into town because... Uh, I think partly to do with the fact that more and more people are moving into East Anglia, but you just in encounter so many uh, like extraordinarily aggressive drivers on the road. It was genuinely rather frightening. Um, whenever I see any of those sort of little white cars, sort of special white cars, you know, called sort of the X2, you know, the H2SO4 wife beater Mark VI, that kind of stuff, with we'll lots of bits stuck on and some uh, snarling twerp at the wheel, I just sort of like pull over and let them go by because I think one of these days, one of these places is going to kill me. And it's always the case, they never kill themselves. They always kill some uh, family of four or something like that. And all you have to do is pick up the local papers, you know. And, you know, the, the, the accident, the number of accidents, fatal accidents in uh, last year set a record, and I don't doubt that 1990 will top that as well unless something radical happens. So I get into town about 6.30, uh, 7 o'clock, something like that, go and open the mail, uh, go into the studio at 7.30, uh, prepare the programme, watch a bit of TV, because <laughs> uh, they have the sports channels on in there, so I watch a bit of football while I'm getting myself sorted out. And then at 8.30 I go on the air, programme finishes at 10, 
two-hour drive home, get home just after midnight, and then up again at seven o'clock the next morning. So it's uh, and this this happens, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then on Friday, um, I'm, I'm sorting stuff out, you know, just trying to catch up on the things that have come in during the week, really. So I work Fridays, Saturdays. Uh, I usually take Saturday afternoon off, uh, either to fall asleep in front of the TV or to go and watch Stow Market or do something like that, or to go somewhere with the children. Then on Sundays, uh, I'm preparing stuff for programmes for Radio Cambridge. So it's, um, you know, so it goes on. Where to then or what next? Well, I don't know the answer to that, really. I mean, I'm perfectly happy doing what I do, although I sometimes wish there wasn't quite so much of it. I mean, I like doing the programmes. I'd like to have as much time on the air as I have now. I just wish that there wasn't so much stuff competing for my attention, really. There's just the number of newspapers, magazines, uh, letters, tapes, records that come in really does take up more time than there actually is. Uh, so I'd like to see that reduced, but there's not much that I can do to reduce it because listening to records is not something that you can either delegate nor accelerate, as I always say rather flippantly, but it's true. You know, I can't give a pile of records to somebody else and say, you go and listen to those and see if I like them, <laughs> you know. Um, and you can't play them at the wrong speed to make them pass quicker. So uh, what, what I'd like, really, is, as I say, a reduction in the quantity of stuff coming in. Um, but by and large, I'd like to press on... I mean, you have no ambitions to play Hamlet. Uh, I don't want to be on TV. I've done the odd bit of TV stuff. I've never been any good at it. And apart from when I used to do Top of the Pops with Kid Jensen, uh, I've never really enjoyed it a great deal. But I, I liked doing that because I liked Kid. You know, it used to be, we used to have a really entertaining day. And, of course, you get to meet famous people. And it's always the case that the ones you think are going to be utterly unspeakable are actually quite nice. And the ones you think are going to be quite nice are complete swine. So, uh, you know, you find that somebody like... I mean, it's one of the advantages of the job is that, for example, for example, Alf Flossie is uh, obsessed with Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan and things. Um, and I didn't even know anything about this until once I was sitting in the sitting room and her and her friend Chloe came in and started watching Neighbours and they just knew everything about it, you know, I mean, absolutely every detail of Neighbours, to the point where I noticed that they, when they were talking to each other, they even spoke with slight Australian accents, which I was rather horrified by. But I was able to take Chloe and uh, Flossie into London to meet Kylie Minogue. Uh, who's minute, I mean, it's really much smaller than people imagine. You could walk under the coffee table with an umbrella up. and uh, uh, But she was really sweet to them, you know. She was a lot of people in that situation would have said, get these kids out of here, you know. But she was really nice, and she tried to get them to talk to her and had a photo taken with them, and it was most agreeable. And then, as I say, other people you think are going to be really nice aren't. But uh, as I, say, I have no ambitions at all. I'd like to do more writing. I like writing. I find it very therapeutic. And people keep offering me money to write a book, but I just haven't got the time to do it. What about John Ravenscroft, M.A.? Well, I was very, very surprised and uh, very pleased indeed, obviously, particularly because uh, I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about having been too stupid to go to university. And working with John Walters at Radio 1, who uh, actually went to university and, and, and came away with a B.A., which is always kind of waved over my head, really. A lot of kind of, look, you don't know what you're talking about, you're not an educated man, you haven't got a degree like me. So to, to be able to kind of trump him without actually having to go and do any work <laughs> at all was most satisfying. I noticed he hasn't mentioned his degree since uh, I got the honorary one. Um, but I was genuinely, enormously flattered... Um, to be, you know, when, when it all happened. And the, the ceremony itself and the entire weekend was absolutely marvellous. I mean, I shall never forget it as long as I live. And uh, some, of the, some of the things are a bit frightening, really. You know, you find yourself sitting next to a cousin of the Queen and, and uh, wondering what are we going to talk about. You know, I can't talk about <laughs> things like football and uh, the latest Fall LP. But actually, obviously, as people always do, it turned out to be a perfectly agreeable uh, person. So it, the, the whole weekend was absolutely marvellous. And... Uh, the actual ceremony uh, was was beyond belief, really, and and uh, uh, people applauded very generously. The man made a, a most uh, touching speech, and and uh, the whole thing was stupendous. The, even the children, I think, were slightly impressed. You know, to see Daddy down there dressed in these rather peculiar <laughs> clothes, and uh, people were making a fuss. So I think they were quite pleased with it all. Are you a religious man? Um, not at all, no. An, an unrepentant heathen, uh, to be honest. 
um, rather distrustful or mistrustful, whichever is the correct word, of people who are religious. Uh, somebody once told me uh, a few years ago, a woman who should have known too because she'd been brought up in a strict sort of uh, Calvinist background and uh, uh, a rather brutal background as far as I could tell too. And she told me from her experience that I was exactly the type of person who has a religious experience. And I live in mortal dread of that, I must admit, because uh, to me what makes life attractive is the uncertainty of it all, you know, and the, and the knowledge that you, uh, or, or the, the fact that the knowledge that there is no knowledge in a sense, you don't know what's going to happen to you next. And I remember once one of those bizarre things, which I can't remember how it came about, but uh, I was involved in a debate with, amongst others, Mary Whitehouse. And uh, every time she got cornered, I mean, I thought she'd be a very skillful debater in the kind of Thatcher mould, you know, be able to tear you to shreds every time you opened your mouth. And uh, she was rather disappointing because every time she was cornered, she introduced the kind of Jesus card, as I thought of it. You see, well, if you don't really believe... I mean, I'm sure there was a bloke called Jesus, but uh, the rest of it I don't really go along with much. Um, and uh, so every time she was cornered, she would introduce the Jesus card. But, of course, if you don't believe in all of this, there's not a great deal you can say, really. It's like somebody said, well, it all depends on what the Martians think. And you think, well, it may do to you, but it doesn't to me. So uh, not a believer, really, no. Although, at the same time, I quite like... Um, I mean, I like sort of old-fashioned Catholicism. You see, when I went to uh, live in Dallas, and uh, I used to go down to Houston um, and met a girl down there whose family were Czechoslovak and, uh, and, and very devout Catholics, and uh, with the appalling confidence of youth, when they said to me rather warily, are you a Roman Catholic? I said, of course. Uh, there's never having been in a Catholic church in my life. So they, we were all dragged off to Mass. And it was an extraordinary experience. Trying to, it was an old-fashioned Mass with the bells ringing and people bouncing up and down and stuff like this. And uh, I, I managed to bluff my way uh, in, in uh, Roman Catholicism and, and afterwards went out and even danced the Schottish, which I'd never danced in my life before or since, because uh, she was the most attractive and uh, amusing woman. But... Um, I mean, I quite like that. You see, I like the idea, rather like going around an old... I like going around old churches and cathedrals and things and because I like the idea of the, the history of it and I like the idea of the old-fashioned mass because it was, you know, you felt that you were taking part in something which was... Uh, uh, you could go to the, roughly the same thing anywhere on Earth and something that had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I've always said that, uh, uh, again, rather flippantly, but I think it's in, it has a basis in... in in fact, but then on the other hand, the kind of contemporary view of God, as I always say, is the Cliff Richard view, a chap in a polar neck sweater who lets you beat him at table tennis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is not the kind of uh, deity that I can really much look up to. So I prefer not knowing. And when you see the damage that's done, to, you know, around the world in the name of religion and has been historically, I think you're better off being a barbarian. Relate the event which you always regard as such an irony. Well, at one stage, when I was at school, I actually thought about going into the church, not because I had any particular belief, but because I'd read a lot of P.G. Woodhouse and liked the idea of turning up on kind of noble lawns and eating cucumber sandwiches and talking codswallop up far into the night uh, with grand people. Uh, it never occurred to me that I might be sent to some kind of grim inner city uh, place, you know, and have to actually earn my living there. Um, so... I became disillusioned with all of this, though, at, at, at Shrewsbury, where you used to be beaten for being late for chapel. And this seemed to me to run rather counter to the spirit of Christian forgiveness, to be given a good walloping because you were a few moments late. So uh, I abandoned the idea. And also the disappointment of confirmation, because uh, I'd been led to believe that confirmation would lead to a sort of great physical transformation and uh, so forth. And I'd rather expected this to manifest itself in the form of being able to see through girls' clothing. And uh, when it turned out that I couldn't, I thought, well, that's the end of it for me. That's <laughs> to bring the thing to what is now the sort of natural conclusion for reflections, think, if you will, for a minute, and imagine yourself in the situation where you are to be stripped of every memory you have bar one. You may only keep one. You will lose all the others. Which would be the one you'd keep? Well, I'm tempted to say Alan Kennedy's goal against Real Madrid in the Parc de Prince in Paris uh, in the European <laughs> Cup final. Um, uh, that was as fine a moment as ever happened in my life. But I should, I, I should have to try and be, I think, allowed a kind of composite memory of the birth of the children because I was present at the birth of, uh, as I said, William had to be taken out with pliers, so I didn't see that. But the, uh, I saw the rest of them being born and uh, the hospital in Ipswich where they were all born. Um, 
they inc I think now out of necessity more than anything else because they haven't got the resources. But then they used to encourage dads because, uh, you know, if you're there and obviously your wife's in some pain, you feel terribly guilty and feel as though you ought to be doing something to kind of sh carry a bit of the burden. And they encourage dads to take uh, one or two little non-medical tasks on board. So uh, they, they were just stupendous events. And obviously the holding uh, your newborn child is, is a matchless experience, I think. And that then brings to a close another programme in these series Reflections here on BBC Radio Cambridgeshire. My thanks to my guest this week, John Peel, and indeed my thanks to him for last week too. But as always, my most special thanks to you for listening. Until next week then, goodbye, and do take special care. Bye-bye.